Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Comstock Channel. I'm Marlon Bowling with you. Appreciate you joining us. As always, be sure to like this video and subscribe to this video. Click that bell icon so you'll be notified if we have new episodes that come out. And also make sure that you share this information with others. Well, I'm pleased to introduce Tom Bias, and he is the CEO of the American Carbon Alliance. He joins us today to talk about all things that are carbon-related. That seems to be a big buzzword these days, Tom. Uh, a lot of talk about that. Several states are playing a key role in the middle part of the country out there. Seems like the latest one to really make the headlines would be South Dakota, but Iowa has been involved in it, North Dakota. And uh, you're kind of in the middle of this whole thing, and maybe you can give us a little Carbon 101 for our producers out there that might be watching about what this is all about and why they should be interested in this topic. Uh, maybe they're not aware of the money involved in this. Yeah, you know, the, the whole debate about capturing carbon, uh, um, not just in, in, in agriculture, but worldwide. Uh, has been a big focus of a number of countries. And um, in the area of ethanol production, it's easy to capture the carbon that goes up that smokestack, convert it, uh, liquefy it, and ship it by pipeline to areas of the country where it can be stored forever. They have to be areas that have the geological formations to do that. In the United States, really, if you look at that ethanol belt, uh, where mo all the ethanol plants are, uh, it goes basically from the Dakotas to uh, through Ohio, and some in Pennsylvania, plant or two in New York. But the middle part of that, from Illinois to North Dakota, does not have the geological formation to store carbon. So if you're going to take advantage of it, you have to have a mechanism to get there. Uh, I like to... And uh, use the analogy, it's like a baseball game on capturing carbon uh, in agriculture. The first at bat have been the pipelines, and that drew the most attention. A, a very vocal minority that doesn't want to see any kind of pipeline. You know, Marlon, I always tell people, I think you could propose a, a, um, a milk and cookies pipeline, and people would be against it because they have such a negative impact of the word pipeline. And even though that's the safest, most efficient way to travel uh, or uh, ship products, liquefied product. And ethanol, it's easy. Uh, again, the only thing that goes up that smokestack is carbon. You can easily capture it. You don't have to separate it from other pollutants that go up the smokestack because there are none at an ethanol plant. And so then you can take advantage of a lower carbon index for the production of ethanol. What that means is whether it's higher blends in the marketplace, exports, or next generation biofuels or fuels such as sustainable aviation fuel, ethanol would qualify as a feedstock. That creates demand. And really in any commodity uh, that you want to talk about in agriculture, uh, the value of that commodity depends upon supply and demand. And if you have an excess amount of supply, and not enough demand, you're going to have a cheap price and a less than profitable price on that commodity. The inverse is true, or the reverse is true if you have uh, more demand than you have supply. And in American agriculture, you know, I'm se going to be 72 years old, but I started out farming in Indiana and I farmed full time for 20 years and uh, went to Washington in the late 80s. And during that last 10, 15 years that we farmed, most of our income to help meet the bills came from the federal government, uh, who had to make up for the loss of a marketplace. And then about 20 years ago, the ethanol industry took off in a serious manner and started creating new, consistent domestic demand for corn. Corn being the biggest crop, that carried over to other commodities. Uh, and the old theory about a rising tide lifts all boats and a sinking ship brings them all down certainly comes to play. And we saw profitability return to American agriculture, unlike any other period that we can think of. And all because we had new consistent demand. 
Well, now fast forward to today. The ethanol industry really isn't uh, growing much on the end, uh, the end sales. Uh, everybody that buys a new car gets one that gets better mileage than the previous one, so that's less fuel usage. Everybody that buys an electric vehicle, that certainly uh, eliminates the need for fuel, period. So we're not seeing uh, the growth catch up with the, uh, the in incredible production capabilities of the ethanol industry and American farmers. And so we're getting an excess of supply. You look on the corn side, exports have uh, are not keeping pace. Brazil is exporting more corn than us. They're exporting more ethanol than us. Uh, you look at the world stock reports, uh, you're seeing a growing supply that's overhanging the marketplace. And that's dangerous. So you need new demand. Along comes Virtually every country in the United States or in the world attempts to lower the amount of carbon going up in the air to uh, address the climate challenges that we face worldwide. New markets exist. Sustainable aviation fuel is kind of that low-hanging fuel. That's a potentially 50 billion gallon a year market. 50 billion gallons. Now, currently the ethanol industry is 15 billion gallons a year. So you can see how big that is. Uh, most of the sustainable aviation fuel today is made out of fats and oils. Uh, there's just not a great amount of supply. So you need a new feedstock. Here comes the rub. You can't be a feedstock for sustainable aviation fuels unless your carbon index is uh, low enough to qualify. And that's why capturing that carbon is so important. And plus, if you think about it, um, you know, uh, people in the livestock industry often talk about, uh, you know, a pig goes into the packing house and they use everything but the squeal. Well, the ethanol industry really uh, only uses about two thirds of that kernel of corn. One third of it makes ethanol. That's the starch in the, in the kernel of corn. The another third of it is the fibers, the oils, the proteins which is vital to livestock. That's what livestock need, and that comes back in a co-product called distiller's grain. But virtually one-third of that kernel of corn is going up the smokestack with no value and going up in the air. And we can capture it, we can market it, and we can return profitability to American agriculture. Now, you said that they would actually pump it into the ground? Is that correct? I, I guess when I think of carbon, I always think of like coal, something like a hard substance. Diamonds are made of carbon. How do you pump carbon? I mean, how do they do that? Does that take a lot of water or, or what are the mechanics of that? It takes some water, but not a lot. They capture it and they liquefy it and they put it in a pipeline uh, or I guess you could put it in a truck or on a rail, uh, which aren't necessarily safe means of transportation uh, as safe as a pipeline. But putting on a pipeline is efficient. Uh, it's inexpensive. Uh, and you basically take it to the location. Uh, in the case of the Summit Pipeline, it was North Dakota. In the case of Navigator or Wolf, they go to Illinois uh, to bury it in the rock formations there. And they're basically into uh, caverns and they can cap it, and they have to be able to certify that it's going to be there for a thousand years, uh, so it it doesn't come back up into the air, and uh, uh, the process is, is pretty simple, really. Um, now, it gets more complicated, like at a coal-fired pl plant, uh, creating electricity, because more than carbon goes up that smokestack. Then you have to separate all the other pollutants out. That's why I say ethanol, we're kind of first at bat uh, because it's an easy process. This is the largest uh, carbon sequestration program ever proposed in the United States. So we're attracting attention from a lot of critics out there, many of which don't want to see the internal combustion engine uh, succeed into the future. They want to go all electric. And, you know, their electric vehicles have their place in certain locations, 
They don't work uh, all across the country. They certainly don't work in an airplane. Heavy batteries uh, uh, just isn't going to get it. So they need that sustainable aviation fuel, which we can do. Well, one thing that I guess I would like explained to me is uh, maybe you can give us an example of how the farmer benefits from this. How do they get an increased market price? Explain how that works. It's all about demand. And supply and demand determine surprise. So if you have more demand for ethanol uh, because it's being produced in a low carbon uh, index uh, with a low carbon index, uh, then that demand is going to, to grow for that type of ethanol. That also means that the demand for the corn produced by the farmer is going to grow. Um, it just is when the ethanol industry uh, sprang up 20 years ago for real, uh, that's when farmers start getting a higher price. And I think any farmer you ever talk to who lives near an ethanol plant saw their corn basis, which determines their ultimate price, uh, rise anywhere from 25 cents or more per bushel. A lot of estimates uh, that have been uh, thrown up by various economies are saying uh, farmers could receive seventy-five cents to a dollar fifty more per bushel if really? we, because the increased demand. You're also going to have you'll see a growth in the ethanol industry as well. You'll see more plants. That also yeah. apply to uh, maybe examples where they make ethanol out of grain sorghum. Then sure, if they capture the carbon out of grain sorghum, yeah, same. Any place that, that you're doing it, and like I said, the ethanol industry is easy. It's very easy. In fact, there's some ethanol plants right now that are pumping it, capturing it, and pumping it directly into the ground in North Dakota and in Illinois. Uh, there are many more uh, on proposals on the books, Marlon, that uh, people want to do it in, in those areas where you can just uh, pump it straight down. But those in the middle of the ethanol belt have to ship it somewhere. You talked about a carbon score. Who comes up with that? Who assigns that? Uh, well, various government entities. And you have an international agency that scores uh, the carbon index uh, for fuels, um, and like ethanol. And uh, you have a domestic one. And this started probably... 20 years ago out in California where they started giving a carbon index score to all types of fuels. And at the time, they charged the U.S. ethanol production with a huge indirect land use charge, claiming that we were the result of tearing down a rainforest, which had nothing to do with the, the production of corn. Uh, and so that number started very high. And then you started to get other entities involved in how you calculate it, including the Department of Energy and the Argonne National Lab uh, has what's called the GREET model. And that GREET model is much more realistic uh, than all the others in terms of the indirect land use uh, charge. It's a charge to ethanol plant. And every ethanol plant's index is different depending on various factors such as their you know, their power source uh, and uh, other items that they've done to uh, uh, reduce that carbon score. But they're all probably average around 60 uh, on the carbon index score. And to qualify, uh, you need to be below 50 uh, to qualify for sustainable aviation fuels. I guess one thing that always kind of concerns me is anytime you're dealing with a government or a government entity, that could end up being a moving target. You know, they can readjust the levels at, at a whim, and and sometimes that's kind of hard to plan on. Uh, if if you would, talk about it for just a second here before we run out of time, about the latest developments here. Um, where are we having issues with getting the pipeline process and the application process done? Uh, where, is, where is it done? Where is it needing some work? Uh, what are what are the snags here? Well, basically, uh, a quick update on all the states involved. Uh, Iowa, uh, the hearings, the application, all of that is complete. They're in the determination phase. 
and we expect the Iowa Utilities Board to announce within the next 30 days the uh, decision on whether or not to grant a permit. Um, Following that, in North Dakota, they will have their hearings, public hearings on at their utility commission uh, within the next couple of months, and then following that, a determination. South Dakota is behind uh, because South Dakota uh, Public Utilities Commission uh, decided not to preempt the counties early on. And so then we had to go back to the drawing board and get the legislature to say, well, it doesn't make any sense if every county and every township and every unit of government can uh, make a change in in what's required to build a pipeline and, uh, through the uh, through the state. So uh, the state legislature went back and said that certainty resolve resound relies upon the decision of that uh, utilities commission. So that that was important legislation. That goes into effect July 1st. Um, Summit can apply for a application, uh, and the state has to decide within one year, uh, give approval or denial of that. After that, then it goes into the building stage, right? And people say, oh, well, you know, we don't want this, we don't want this. Well, uh, probably the average in every state is voluntarily 80% of the people along the routes have signed up um, for um, uh, to allow it to go through their property. So um, it's welcome. It, you know, uh, you're always going to have some people against it, but I think when they stop and think about the positive benefits that this provides, they far outweigh any negatives that could be imagined. So are there other states that could also be involved in this event? Yeah, then, uh, Nebraska. And Minnesota are also proposed to be uh, additions to the pipeline. And then, um, as I mentioned before, you have ethanol plants uh, in areas where you have the geological structure to be able to store, pump it straight down yourself, right? North Dakota, uh, parts of Kansas can be there. Uh, And uh, certainly Colorado, there's plants that have proposed to uh, ship it straight down, as well as in Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, those states um, generally have the rock formations to be able to do it. Well, I would think that would mean some revenue as well for the end result of the pipeline where they would store it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and, and all of it, I think ultimately you'll see all the ethanol plants participate in one uh, manner or another. Uh, It's just that the pipeline was the first big one, and that one drew out all the critics. That one drew out all the opposition. Um, And and we saw one of the pipelines being proposed, uh, Navigator Pipeline, uh, they withdrew. They they weren't as far along as Summit. Uh, And I think that woke a lot of people up that we need to get out there and stand up for our own industry. Um, And then you've got a couple other smaller ethanol uh, or pipelines, one called Wolf that goes from Iowa to Illinois, and uh, a couple of small regional pipelines that are in the works. So everyone's looking to do it. It can be done. Uh, it's, it's nothing new. They've been, they've been uh, capturing carbon and sequestering it in North Dakota and shipping it uh, to Canada. Uh, for the last 20 some years. Interesting stuff. Well, thank you for explaining all these terms. Mm-hmm. And I know it's it's a relatively new concept to a lot of locations. Uh, some folks aren't really aware of uh, what all is involved here or how it could affect them. But uh, you provided some really helpful information. I sure appreciate that. So we'll probably be doing more of this informational type programming in the future sure. and bring on some other guests with different viewpoints as well. And and see what everybody thinks about this. I just want to get the facts out there for everybody, and they can uh, make their own decision and and decide what they want to do. But I appreciate that, Tom, and uh, thanks for all that. Uh, Hopefully we can uh, connect again and and maybe get an update from you. Thank you, and and thanks for what you do. Uh, Information uh, is really powerful when uh, oftentimes people make decisions in a vacuum. 
and uh, we want the facts out there on both sides and uh, the the benefits weren't getting uh, weren't getting uh, uh, out to the people that making the decisions. So thanks for doing what you're doing, Marlon. Well, very much appreciated. Uh, thank you, Tom. Tom Bias, the CEO of American Carbon Alliance. And that'll do it for this particular episode. I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about this as we move forward. For producer Brianne Hendrickson, I'm Marlon Bowling. We'll catch you next time right here on the Comstock Channel. Thanks for joining us on our Comstock YouTube channel. Don't forget you can also find us on Facebook and TikTok as well.